Welcome to First Baptist Church of Redmond. We're so glad you could join us for worship today. I'm Todd Christ, one of the deacons here. We're going to have a short five-minute countdown video, and then we will begin worship.
All right, so now we are into our worship time. And first we have a short message from Pastor Doug. Um, pray for our family. Uh, Adam has tested positive for the coronavirus. Um, he's uh, feeling fine and uh, is bored out of his head. Um, I have taken a test for coronavirus, but we don't have the results yet. And so we're not with you because um, I'm using us uh, extreme prejudice uh, for contagion. Uh, thank you, and I appreciate Todd and uh, the Nuris for covering for us. Thank you. Bye. So please keep the Johnston family in your prayers right now as uh, they're waiting for test results to see how everybody's doing. I know Brittany has been getting regular test results working in the health industry and she's been coming back negative. So things are looking good there. So hopefully uh, we'll find out more information soon. Uh, just a little update, Carl Barth Facebook group. If you wanna see some interesting, hilarious uh, and uh, spiritual things during this time of year, you can always look at that and find out some uh, information you can have with your family and friends. And a quick little calendar of events. So today and tomorrow, if you get the chance, drive out to Camp Gilead. They're having a little Giladvent celebration going on where they'll have a living nativity, people singing. Uh, you can get, I believe, hot cocoa and some snacks as you show up to drive around and see things. So it is very COVID safe as people are staying in their cars and just driving around the camp and seeing the sights. On the December 24th, we have our Christmas Eve service here at 5 p.m. Please join us. And then January 9th, oh, it's a new year. Christmas will be over. It's time to take down our Christmas decorations. As lovely as it's been to have them up, uh, I always need to take it down. We need the room for other things. All right. And now, today, as we will be singing Christmas hymns, We'll be introducing each hymn with a reading. So those of you that have a reading, as soon as the title appears, please come up and do your reading. And those that have readings after this first song, please be prepared. Don't wait till the end of the song and then start coming up. As if the song is ending, please be ready to come up and do your reading. So our first reading today will be Joy to the World. Written by Benjamin. Morning, all of you. Joy to the world. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in song. Rejoice and sing praises. Until Isaac Watts came along, most of the singing in British churches was from the Psalms of David. The church, especially the Church of Scotland, had labored over Psalms with great effort and scholarship translating them into poems with rhyme and rhythm suitable for singing. As a young man in Southampton, <clears throat> Isaac had become dissatisfied with the quality of singing, and he keenly felt the limitations of being only to sing the psalm, so he invented the English hymns. He did not, however, neglect the psalms, in, 19, sorry, in 1719, he published a unique hymnal, one in which he had translated, interpreted, and paraphrased the Old Testament psalm through the eyes of New Testament faith. He called it simply the Psalms of David, imitated in the language of New Testament. Taking various psalms, 
he studied them from the perspective of Jesus and the New Testament and then formed them into verses for singing. I have rather expressed myself as I may suppose David would have done if he lived in the days of Christianity. That's what Watts explained. And by this, it means perhaps I have sometimes hit upon the true intent of Spirit of God in those verses farther and clearer than David himself could ever discover. Watts arch rival Thomas Bradbury was greatly critical of Watts songs which he called them whims instead of hymns. He accused Watts of thinking he was King David. Watts replied in a letter, you tell me that I rival it with David, the sweet psalmist of Israel. I abhor the thought, while yet at the same time I am fully persuaded that the Jewish psalm book was never designed to be the only psalter for the Christian church. Joy to the world is Isaac Watts' interpretation of Psalms 98, which says, Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. As he read Psalms 98, Watts pondered the real reason for shouting forth joyfully to the Lord. The Messiah has come to redeem us. The result, despite now forgotten criticism of men like Bradbury, has been the timeless carol that has brightened our Christmases for nearly 300 years. Joy is the serious business of heaven. To be a joy bearer and a joy giver says everything. For in your life, if one is joyful, it means that one is faithful living for the God and that nothing else counts. If one gives joys to other, one is doing the good work of God. With joy without and joy within, all is well. I can conceive no higher way. Thank you. Well, if you'll stand, we'll go ahead and sing Joy to the World. Will be reading while shepherds watch their flocks. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Isaiah 40, 11. This popular carol owes its endurance to two men with dark financial woes. First, Nahum Tate was born in Dublin in 1652 to a preacher who was literally named Faithful, Reverend Faithful Tate, original spelling. <laughs> After attending Trinity College in Dublin, young Nahum migrated to London to be a writer. His success was slow in coming, but he dabbled with plays, adapted the prose of others, and eventually was named a poet laureate in 1692 and appointed royal historiographer 10 years later. Unfortunately, Nahum was intemperate and careless with handling money, and he lived in financial distress constantly. He died in an institution for the debtors in 1715. His chief claim to fame was his collaboration with Nicholas Brady in compiling a hymn book entitled The New Version of the Psalms of David, published in 1696. It was reissued in 1700 with a supplement in which this carol first appeared. The words, while shepherds watched their flocks, represent a very literal paraphrase of Luke 2, 
verses 8 through 14, making this one of our most biblically accurate Christmas carols. The second man instrumental in the song's success was George Hendrick Friedrich Handel, composer of the music to which this carol is sung. Handel was born in Germany with an inborn talent of musical genius. His father pressured him to, be, to enter law school, but George would not be denied, writing his first composition by the age of 12 and amazing choir masters with his artistry. He also eventually moved to London, where he enjoyed great success for a season. Then his popularity waned. His income dwindled, and he went bankrupt. It was the remarkable success of the Messiah that salvaged Handel's career and his bank account. Through it all, Handel's powerful personality pressed on. On one occasion, just as a concert was about to begin, his friends gathered to tell him that the concert hall was nearly empty. Few people had bought tickets. Never mind, Handel said, after pausing to absorb the news. The music will sound better due to the nearly empty room. How ironic. These two men never met. They both struggled with poverty, faced bankruptcy, and hurried about making ends meet. Yet they enriched the world beyond measure, providing millions of people for scores of generations with the gift of song every Advent season. Shepherds at the Grange, where the babe was born, sang with many a change, Christmas carols till morn. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. If you'll stand with me, we'll sing the next hymn here. While shepherds watch the flocks by night, Upon his conversion, Charles Wesley immediately began writing hymns, each one packed with doctrine, all of them exhibiting strength and sensitivity, both beauty and theological brawn. He wrote constantly, and even on horseback, his mind was flooded with new songs. He often stopped at houses along the road and ran in asking for pen and ink. He wrote more than 6,000 hymns during his lifetime, and he didn't like people tinkering with the words. In one of his hymnals, he wrote, I beg leave to mention a thought which has been long upon my mind and which I should long ago have inserted in the public papers, but uh, had I not been unwilling to stir up the nest of hornets, Many gentlemen have done my brother and me, though without meaning us, the uh, honor to reprint many of our hymns. Now, they are perfectly welcome to do so, provided they reprint them just as they are. But I desire they would not attempt to mend them, for they are really not able. None of them is able to mend either the sense or the verse. Therefore, I must beg of them these two favors, either to let them stand just as they are, 
to take things for better or worse, or to add the true reading in the margin or at the bottom of the page that we may no longer be accountable either for the nonsense or the doggard of other men. But one man did the church a great favor by publishing one of Charles' best loved hymns. When Charles was 32, he wrote a Christmas hymn that began, Hark how all the welkin rings, glory to the king of kings, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, Join the triumph of the skies, universal nature say, Christ the Lord is born today. The word welkin was an old English term for the vault of heaven. It was Charles' friend, evangelist George Whitfield, who, when he published this carol in his collection of hymns in 1753, changed the words to the now beloved Hark the herald angels sing. So if you'll stand with me, we'll sing that song here. <laughs> O come, all ye faithful. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with his mother Mary, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Matthew 2.11 John Francis Wade, author of this hymn, was hounded out of England. He was a Roman Catholic layman in Lincolnshire, but because of persecution arising from the Jacobite Rebellion, Streams of Catholics fled to France and Portugal, where communities of English-speaking Catholics appeared. But how could he, a refugee, support himself? In those days, the printing of musical scores was cumbersome, and copying them by hand was an art. In the famous Roman Catholic College and Ministry Center in Douai, France, Wade taught music and became renowned as a copyist of musical scores. His work was exquisite. In 1743, Wade, 32, had produced a Latin Christmas carol beginning with the phrase, Adeste Fidelis, Lete Triumphantes. At one time, historians believed he had simply discovered an ancient hymn by an unknown author, but most scholars now believe Wade himself composed the lyrics. Seven original hand-copied manuscripts of this Latin hymn have been found, all of them bearing Wade's signature. John Wade passed away on August 16, 1786 at age 75. 
His obituary honored him for his beautiful manuscripts that adorned chapels and homes. As time passed, English Catholics began returning to Britain and they carried Wade's Christmas Carol with them. One day, an Anglican minister named Reverend Frederick Oakley, who preached at Margaret Street Chapel in London, came across Wade's Latin Christmas Carol. Deeply moved, he translated it into English for Margaret Street Chapel. The first line of Oakley's translation said, Ye faithful, approach ye. Somehow, ye faithful, approach ye didn't catch on, and several years later, Oakley tried again. By this time, Oakley, too, was a Roman Catholic priest, having converted to Catholicism in 1845. Perhaps his grasp of Latin had improved because, as he repeated over and over, the Latin phrase, Adeste Fidelis, Lete Triumphantis, he finally came up with the simpler, more vigorous, O come, all ye faithful, joyful, and triumphant. So, Two brave Englishmen, lovers of Christmas and lovers of hymns, living a hundred years apart, writing in two different nations, combined their talents to bid us come, joyful and triumphant, and adore him, born king of the angels. You stand, please, and we'll sing this one for my friends. First Noel. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Luke 2 8. No other carol inspires such a mood. The sweet, plaintive strains of the first Noel, quietly sung on a snow clad Christmas Eve, bring tears to the eyes and gentle peace to the heart. Noel, 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 Noel. Born is the King of Israel. If only we knew who wrote it. It first appeared anonymously in some ancient Christmas carols published by David Gilbert in 1823. And the traditional music evidently came from the un, an unknown source in the west of England. The poetry itself is plain. If we were to recite this rather lengthy piece, we'd get only a garbled sense of the Christmas story. There's no indication in scripture, for example, that the shepherds saw the Magi's star and that the final verse of the original carol seems anticlimactic. But when combined with its wistful music, the words glow and our hearts are strangely warmed. The word Noel seems to be a French word with Latin roots, natalis, meaning birthday. Modern hymns omit several of the verses. Here are the last four. This star drew to the northwest, or Bethlehem it took its rest. And there it did both stop and stay right over the place where Jesus lay. 
Then they did know assuredly within the house the king did lie. One entered in then for to see and found the babe in poverty. Then entered in those wise men three, full reverently upon bended knee, and offered there in his presence their gold and myrrh and frankincense. If we in our time do well, we shall be free from death and hell, for God hath prepared for us all a resting place in general. Noel, 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 born is the king of Israel. Christians awake, salute the happy morn, whereon the savior of the world is born, John Byron. You stand. Jesus Christ is born today. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Adolf Hitler rose to power in Germany, determined to take over the German church and dictate the nation's religion. He falsely accused many of the clergymen of treason, theft, or sexual malpractice, and priests, nuns, and church leaders who were arrested on trumped-up charges. Religious publications were suspended. Hitler encouraged couples to be married by state officials rather than by priests and pastors. In 1935, he outlawed prayer in the schools, and he did all he could to replace the Bible, or Bible reading, with Nazi propaganda. He had greater difficulty with the holidays because Germans had faithfully observed Easter and Christmas for centuries. He sought instead to keep the holidays but to reinterpret their meaning. Easter became a celebration of heralding the arrival of spring, and Christmas was turned into a totally pagan festival. Carols and nativity plays were banned from the schools in 1938, and even the name Christmas was changed to Yuletide. Holy days become holidays, and the sacred was secularized. Today we're amazed to observe the same thing happening in America as Social libertarians, aided by the media and the courts, seem determined to drain Christmas of its religious significance and make it a purely secular, secular pagan holiday. Let's do whatever it takes to remind our society that one can't even spell the word Christmas without Christ. We need to stay focused on him during the season to proclaim his birth, life, death, and resurrection, to worship him and to follow the example of the shepherds. When they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning his child, Luke 2.17. Every generation of Christians needs to write its own songs of Christmas. Here is my modest contribution, a new carol set in an old melody, one usually reserved for Easter, 
when we join the voices in Charles Wesley's jubilant anthem, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. The melody, Easter Hymn, is perhaps our most triumphant hymn setting written in the early 1700s by an unknown composer. Why is it only once a year? We can sing the hallelujahs of Christmas too. So remember while December brings the only Christmas day, in the year let there be Christmas in the things you do and say. Wouldn't life be worth the living? Wouldn't dreams be coming true if we kept the Christmas spirit all the whole year through? Anonymous. Sam Fizz. <laughs> with prayer. As uh, you saw from Doug's message, please keep the Johnston family in your prayers as uh, they wait for some test results to see what happens. Um, and of course that they all don't have severe symptoms if they do end up getting this, but uh, hopefully we find out it's just a false positive for Adam and everything's okay. Also pray for those traveling during this time as uh, we're getting ready for Celebrating Christmas, I know this is also going to be a hard time of year for people who aren't gathering together as they're used to doing, so definitely want to pray and keep those in our thoughts that aren't able to get together, that uh, will be missing their families during this time. I know everybody hopes that Zoom calls and all that are going to be the way that people are going to gather, but it's not the same as actually seeing each other, shaking hands, hugging, and uh, enjoying that time together. I know that's one of the things that God designed us for is to have fellowship with one another. So pray that uh, people can make it through this time. So join me in bowing our heads and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we are gathered together today, that we are allowed to continue to gather and worship you. In this time, let us focus our thoughts on your son and his birth to be thankful that you loved us so much that you sent him to redeem us as we are not capable of redeeming ourselves on our own. Lord, we ask you to be with the Johnston family right now as uh, Adam has tested positive for COVID. Pray for uh, pastor's results to come through quickly and pray that uh, they can make it through this time of uncertainty. And I know 
being quarantined and uh, locked away can kind of make you a little stir crazy right now. So pray that Adam is able to get through this, find uh, things to keep himself occupied and busy, that uh, this time can go quickly. Pray that uh, whatever happens, that they feel your hands through all of this. Lord, I also lift up all of those that are traveling during this time. Pray for safe travels uh, wherever people are headed or people that are coming here to visit loved ones, that uh, things just go well. I also pray for all those, Lord, that aren't able to get together with their families during this time, uh, whether it's due to circumstances uh, beyond their control or just out of their own well-being and concern. We just pray that they can feel your love during this time, that uh, they would know that no matter what's going on, they are in your hands. Lord, we've seen that uh, many things have affected people during this time, uh, but we've also heard great stories of how you've intervened to allow people to be there for each other and uh, seeing some amazing outreaches that have happened during all of this. So no matter what, the world may do no matter what the enemy may have in store to try and stop your word from getting out it always makes it through we are so thankful that you love us so much and we are thankful for the gift of your son jesus christ it's in his in his name we pray amen and now we'll do today's scripture reading please stand and join me as we read luke 2 13 through 14. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Thank you. Please be seated. And uh, Merry Christmas to you. Yeah, I think we live in times that uh, I think are probably very similar to what Israel lived in during the same kind of time. It wasn't a season of COVID, but... Uh, what I think is interesting is that the people who were supposed to have known about the fulfillment of the prophecies concerning the Messiah, the very people who were supposed to know uh, didn't seem to be too impressed when Herod asked the, the priests where the Christ would be born, and they said Bethlehem. And it just seemed to be so-so. Uh, and then when the event actually took place, it seemed to escape the notice of, well, all of the Roman Empire, but uh, especially the people that should have known escaped their notice. And I think it's interesting that as I look through, especially the Gospel of Luke, how many of the people that are really involved in what God is doing uh, Elizabeth, Mary, uh, Joseph, Simeon, later. These are people that you probably wouldn't take much notice of. They were people that uh, were just common, ordinary people, but the one thing they had that seemingly the rest of the people did not have was a, a strong faith and link to the Scripture. And uh, so when things began to happen, they were much aware of it, and they knew what was going on. And uh, it's a good reminder for me just to always try to keep my heart and my mind focused on what God is doing so that I don't, you know, I don't get sidetracked by all of the other events that are happening in my day. 
Last week we started in with the great miracles in Christmas. And uh, there are a num of, number of them, and I wanted to continue on uh, today uh, talking about this same subject. And last week we said the first great miracle in Christmas had to do with the conception of Jesus. And we discussed that conception was, for the most part, a very natural event. The expected result is when uh, elements of a man and woman are brought together and they form a new human being. Everybody expects that, everybody understands that, everybody knows that. But the conception of Jesus was accomplished while Mary was still a virgin. In other words, she had not had union, physical union, with Joseph. This uh, does not happen. <laughs> and uh, the scientist of today, of course, would put this on the shelf of irrelevance, myth, stories, legends, whatever it is. Uh, because this is not normal. This doesn't really happen. Jesus was not the offspring of the union between Mary and Joseph. It was a special event that took place by a miracle of God. When we think of the miracles of God, these are all throughout history. Ever since the beginning, God has been involved in our creation. The very first time God speaks is at the very beginning when he said, then God said, let there be light. And uh, so he was involved from the very beginning and continues to be involved in, uh, in our creation, in our lives and events. And uh, our, our challenge, it seems, is to be sense enough, sensitive enough in faith that we can recognize when that's happening. Sometimes, it, uh, for the most part of my life, I know it kind of goes by, and then it, it, it dawns on me, hey, God was, God was here. What is that in the, the Bible? Surely God was in this place, and I did not know it. <laughs> and uh, this seems to be the challenge that we all face. So the second great miracle in Christmas uh, begins here in Luke where the angel says to Mary, because she's pondering over this thing, how is this thing going to take place when I'm not even married? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. And I paraphrased it this way. The Holy Spirit will do a work within you. He will, by his power, cause a holy child to be in you. And for that reason, this holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. The Word become flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. That's the great miracle that that would take place. So <clears throat> the second great miracle in Christmas we call the incarnation. Now, incarnation is simply a Latin word. It means in flesh. And there's nothing uh, inherently miraculous about natural, uh, a natural development of a child. Again, it's one of those expected things of a union between a man and a, and a woman to be made flesh. That new individual that's formed from the elements from man and woman form new flesh. So it's a type, it's an incarnation. But this particular incarnation was uniquely different. And that was Emmanuel, God with us. Now he has taken up that, uh, that event. And that to me is just a, it's what a mystery that is. Why would God do that? Uh, allow himself to be placed within the womb, womb of a woman, be born as flesh and blood like we are, 
uh, and serve the very creation he created. I, that to me, is, I can't even fathom that as I try to, to think about it. It's not the normal course of human existence, is it? The normal course of human existence is to be born and make something out of yourself. It's expected. That's what you're going to do. You're going to rise uh, you know, the, to the top and become a great human being. But it, God did exactly the opposite. It, exactly the opposite. Now, it's interesting. One of the main reasons that Islam does not accept Christianity, and I can remember this when I was a college student uh, living in a men's dormitory at the University of Kansas, and I would spend my lunch times, breakfast times, with a group of Muslims that were also in the, the building, and we'd get into discussions about Jesus Christ. And the one thing that they objected to, and it seemed to cause them a lot of trouble, and that was this phrase, the Son of God. What they thought Christians taught was that God came down, had a union, a physical union with Mary, and produced an offspring within Mary. That's what they think. And it's been a, a tremendous misunderstanding ever since then. And it's kept, I think, a lot of people out of reach of the gospel because they let that little thing uh, become the stumbling block to believing in Christ. So I'd like to take just a minute this morning and try to clear that up for us all, come up with a way to help, especially uh, people who think the Son of God means a direct offspring of God having union with a woman, because it's, uh, that's not at all what Christianity teaches. And it is the key to salvation, isn't it? We must believe that Jesus is the Son of God uh, in order for there to be forgiveness. So I think it's a very important thing to clear up. So let's look at Christianity and the Son of God. Now, when you think of the term Son of God, I think of a couple of passages of Scripture that automatically clear it up, what we're talking about. The first one is in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, referring to the Word, was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being, which tells us right away that the Word was eternally from the beginning. He did not have a beginning. And he did not create himself. He created all things. He himself was God. And then if you keep reading down in John chapter 1, verse 14, it tells us, and the word became flesh. This is the incarnation. The word became flesh, and what did he do? He dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace, and truth. And that word begotten is very, very interesting. We again, we tend to think of having a physical error, but it means the first, uh, the unique one, no one else like him. And that is true. He's had this relationship from all eternity with God. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And then at one point in history, like God has always done, has come down and became flesh and then lived in the world that we live in. There's a, another passage out of Hebrews that's also very instructive. And it says this, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions, and in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us in his Son. Now, I think it's very interesting. you notice the word his is in italics. And if you read it literally, it is 
God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions, in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in son. And it's literally God has spoken to us in the person of his son. So it's God himself, and that is Emmanuel with us. The word become flesh. Whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he, the Son, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of God's nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. That is quite a statement. See, if Jesus wasn't uh, upholding everything by the word of his power, we'd vanish. We'd vanish into nothing. It's... It's Jesus who who keeps the universe running. If that's not a naturalistic process, there may be certain things that appear to be natural, but it's not naturalistic. Jesus is definitely involved with the maintenance of his creation. Very interesting. I don't know if you all have heard of this, the intelligent design movement. Have you all heard of that? It's it's essentially... There are a group of scientists who are emphasizing the fact that creation is too, uh, it's too complex to have begun itself and to maintain itself, evolve itself. It had to have some kind of intelligence. And so they, uh, they have concluded there must be intelligence behind the universe. Now, this of course, generates a lot of controversy because the, the creationists are, you know, they're all clapping their hands saying, look, look, this is where we've been all along. And the evolutionists are saying, these guys are just nothing more than, than uh, religious creationists. But actually, what's interesting about this word, intelligent, especially intelligent design, and design comes from intelligence, doesn't it? I defy any one of you to develop something where you haven't thought about it. You know what happens when you don't. (laughs) It just, it, it all falls apart. But typically, the things we use, the computers we use, the cars we drive, the TVs we turn on, everything has been the product of some kind of intelligence. And the Greeks had a word for that. Uh, it is the, the same that's found in John 1, the word became flesh. It is the Greek word logos. It means thought, communication, personality, intelligence. Isn't that interesting? So the, they put a big question mark over intelligence. We're not trying to say it's God. We're not trying to say it's Jesus. It's just intelligent design. Well, the only person that I know of in history that is called the, the word of God, the intelligence, is the Logos, Jesus. In the beginning was the word, the Logos. The, the thought, the, the, the communication, the personality, the intelligence. And that is the very thought they're missing out of their, out of their uh, conclusions. It is the mind, life, and feeling behind the whole creation expressed in Jesus at Bethlehem. That was the great miracle, wasn't it? God, our creator, became the son in flesh, Jesus. And our standard, uh, you know, we have these uh, statements of belief throughout history that Christians have put together. One of the most common in the Apostles' Creed is that the son was begotten, not made. And I think that's the big difference. All of us were made. Uh, we were the product of a union, and we developed. Now, it's a, it took great intelligence and thought and, and everything behind it. It's, it's all of God. But it's not like Jesus. Jesus was not made. He was begotten. 
and uh, it's a, I think it's a, very, it's a very unique statement in our confessions of faith. Uh, and we call that the incarnation, God become flesh. Um, <clears throat> if you'll join me for our last hymn, uh, Fairest Lord Jesus, is, um, do we have somebody to read about that? We don't. Okay, let's see. Do I have it here? I may not have it here. I would like to hear the story of that. <laughs> okay. It, it, I think of all the hymns, that is my favorite hymn. And uh, it's, a, it's a great hymn. So why don't you uh, stand and we'll sing our last hymn together. Christmas Eve service.